Hello, everyone. This is Evan Abrams. Welcome to uh, welcome to the late time Friday show. We're going to be doing a little motion design mashup here on Behance Live. If you're watching this uh, on uh, on the YouTubes, please come on over to behance.net slash live. I'm Evan Abrams. I will be your host for this uh, this very interesting. Um, we'll say uh, we'll say an experimental uh, experimental fun time is what we'll be doing. We'll be I don't know how to how to describe what we're going to be doing here today. Uh, we last week asked everyone um, what two things we want to move between, which uh, which two which two objects, uh, which two concepts, and uh, everyone last week pretty unanimously chose cat as number one, and they chose computer as number two. Hello, everybody in the chat. Uh, <laughs> Tim, thank you so much for uh, for your well wishes. I am feeling uh, feeling a lot better. I've been sick for a little while, but I'm getting getting back to it. Getting getting pretty normalized. So, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully my voice holds out. Hopefully, we don't have any audio problems this time. But you let me know. You let me know in the chat, and always let me know in the chat if there's anything confusing or strange, or you just want to ask questions about our process. Because today, admittedly, we are doing something a little strange. I'm going to jump on over to my screen here real quick so that we can enjoy what that is. We are going to be transforming from a cute kitty, this, this lovely cat here. We are going to be transforming from that into a computer. So there are many ways conceptually that might work. And I'm going to take you through a lot of the process and a lot of how we get from one thing to the other. There are many methods we might use, and uh, we are going to we're going to go through some of them. I know we only have an hour, but we will <laughs> try to cover as much as possible. And as always, let me know in the comments here on behance.net/live. Let me know who you are. Let me know where you're from, and let me know what you do in After Effects. Today we're doing a lot of 2D uh, animation stuff, so hopefully this is good. So right now I've got Illustrator open and you can enjoy, um, let's see, this is sort of a line art style. When we first started thinking of the question of how are we going to get from, from one thing to another thing, how are we going to get from a cat to a computer, the first thing we need to consider is sort of what those are even going to look like, what kind of style we're playing in can really limit our options and change the way we might animate things. So if we were working in a line art style, we could do all kinds of things. You know, we could just use a simple write on trim paths to make this stuff come and go. That would be totally fine, I assume. Or we could get a little bit more advanced. We could do sort of, I break it down into kind of five categories of things, big, big five. Um, the first of those is, I've got some notes here that I made throughout the week. The first, and I think, sort of cheapest move we could do is to just zoom out so that the cat is literally on the screen. That would get us from cat to computer. That's one thing we can conceptually do, especially when the second object we're moving to has a screen. Uh, something else what we might do is just simply explode all the geometry of a cat and then recombine it back together into the geometry of a computer. That's fine. Uh, but there are, like I said, there are many, many ways to go. Ultimately, I ended up on this kind of a cat. Um, I wanted to use some gradients to play with that a little bit, and I like kind of the blase look of the cat. Um, hello, hello, London. Hello, DC. Uh, oh, hey, in Toronto. <laughs> hey, Javid. Thank you uh, for tuning in from Toronto. Uh, so here, um, I'm, I'm out in fabulous Ottawa, Ontario, a much smaller, uh, almost not real city. Uh, compared to Toronto, for those of you who are wondering. Um, but here's the cat we ended up uh, working with. And here is the computer we want to go to. So we want to, and here's the cat looking unimpressed behind the computer. So when we're thinking about these two things, maybe you get boards from somebody else. Maybe you're getting assets from somebody else. If you have the opportunity to design your own assets working in this in this space, then it can really help us to design them so that they fit together, right? If this computer were, you know, made of white shapes, it would be more difficult to seamlessly transform from a black cat into a white computer, right? It's, it's so much harder to make that, make that 
change because there's so few points of dis, uh, similarities, right? You want to think about what we call common ge uh, geometry. So what things about one image could be common with the other one, you know, which, which elements could be similar. So that's the first kind of consideration we want to think about. Um, another thing we want to consider is how they might move and what that might mean in the context of, of a narrative. If this is a narrative piece, you know, does it make sense that the cat is on the computer in that context? For us, we're just free forming it. We're going crazy out here. So let me show you where I ended up with a couple of things and then we'll talk about how we got there. So like I was saying, there is the simplest form. Let's do the, let's do the simplest form. Let's talk about that. We have a cat and we're going to get to a computer. All right. What happens in the middle? Well, in the middle, we're going to have a little box pop up and then we zoom out and we're on the computer, right? That is what I would call a bit of a cheat, right? Because we have a cat, we have a computer. One thing doesn't really transform into the other, but we do seamlessly go from the one object to the other object. And actually I can, here we go. I'll make this nice and big. If you ever want to make one of your windows very big, fill up your whole screen, uh, you go ahead and hit the tilde key up in the corner. So we can leave this on a loop while we talk about it a little bit. Um, and, oh, and, and hello from, uh, hello from Finland. <laughs> hello, Lasse. Um, this is fantastic. We've got people from Iraq here. We've got people from all over, Slovenia, from France. This is fantastic. So like I said, in the chat, if you're watching on YouTube, join us on behance.net slash live so I can see you in the, in the chat and we can, we can have a good time talking about this cat turned into a computer. So like I was saying, this here, we're kind of going from a cat to a computer, but we're not really changing one thing into the other thing, right? We're not, um, we're not really doing anything sort of amazing. In fact, this method that we're using here is incredibly versatile in that we could come back later and change what the cat is, and we could come back and, uh, and we could change, you know, what the computer is, because neither of them really interact with each other, right? Neither one have any kind of fluid morphing into each other. They're both kind of their own thing, and they remain very separate. So this can actually be a very flexible uh, way to go. In fact, the entire cat is pre-comped into this little pre-comp here. So we could change anything about it and it would not be <laughs> effective at, affected at all. So this is one kind of method um, that I think is worth exploring and thinking about it, especially if you're considering going from one scene to another. We would kind of call this a nested approach. So the idea here is that one thing is nested inside another thing. This can be helpful if you're gonna go from a scene and you're gonna pull back and reveal that we're inside a building or we're gonna pull back like out of somebody's eye and it's like, oh, we're coming out of the reflection in their eye and then it's something else. So we're just, we're just pulling, it, pulling back and it shrinks. So one thing is shrinking and you know, it's, it's smaller now in that scene, but it's just shrunken down. It's, it becomes a part of that scene. So that's exactly what we're doing here. What we're doing, at its core of this particular technique is we are starting by popping on a little trigger to get people to, to realize, oh, something weird's about to happen. So all we're doing is just scaling on this little shape up in the corner. We have the cat react to it with, uh, with a bunch of things, and we'll drill into that uh, in a little bit. And then everything starts to shrink down. So we are using a null here and we've parented the cat to that, and we've parented a little background layer, this, this uh, white, do, 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 where is that? Whoop. So we've got this little shadow thing, we've got this cat background, we've got the cat itself, and all of these things are parented to this null that itself is shrinking down. So all of this is gonna shrink down at the same time that the computer is shrinking down as well. So by timing these things to happen at the same time, they seem to be congruent with each other. You could also parent this to the computer as well, but I kind of like to keep them separate just so I can enjoy a little bit of unreality. I can cause a little bit of parallax if I'd like to, to have them scale just slightly different. So that they, they are, they're not exact, right? It's not a perfect 3D representation of the thing. So that scales down 
and I put a little bounce here on the computer just so that it feels a little bit fun, right? So it's bounce. And then we make this cat thing go away by parenting again the null that seems to be controlling everything. We parent that to a new null and have it scale and rotate itself away, which is pretty nice. This is the graph editor for those who may not know, but that's basically the idea. Now we've gone from one to the other, right? We're, we've nested, we shrink, and then we remove. So that could be a methodology that you apply to anything. It doesn't have to be cats and computers. It could be, could be people on phones. As long as there's a context to put the thing, then that's where we can go. So hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions about this, this idea though, do let me know and we can, we can come back and we can do a lot more. We can get even deeper into it if you like. So please do let me know in the comments, any things that you'd like us to, to stop and pause and to, and to get on, get deeper into. But what I think is more interesting than this type of method is to do what I would call an intermediate phase. So we're going to take the cat and we are going to turn the cat into something. And then we're going to turn that something into the computer. So you might be looking at here, this cat is made of a lot of, we got some pointy ears, uh, we got a face, we got, we got whiskers. We have all these points of detail, none of which are really uh, computery, I would say. Um, none of which really makes me feel like a computer. But in the end, we're gonna get to computer. We're gonna get there. The computer may have some rounded edges. Like we talked about, we can make our own, we make our own assets however we want. We're in, we're in control of our entire universe in After Effects. But here, we alter the cat to become something else that then will transform more easily into the computer. It's a, it's a third thing that is between the first two things. So what is a, a place we can go it's still cat-like, but it's ready to become more computer-like, if that makes sense. So the catness of the thing is, is going away. We're losing levels of detail of the cat, and then we're increasing level of detail of computer. So conceptually, that's the idea that we're getting into. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Oh, and you know, <laughs> hello, Netherlands. Hello, 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 Kuwait. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it, it's great to see so many people from all over the world coming out here and, and hanging out. And I would also like to know in the comments here, if, how would you do it? What is, when you first have to think about how I'm going to go from making a cat to making a computer, what goes through your head? What considerations are you, are you thinking about? I would, I would love to know because there are almost infinite ways to do this there. In fact, I would, I would say there are infinite ways to do this depending on, the way you look at technology, depending on the way you look at your tools, depending on how you design your assets, this could be totally different. You know, for, for everyone, it can be totally different. And, you know, there are, there are three other options that I didn't have time to get into, so we won't be covering those. Such things as exploding the cat into various blobs. Do not explode cats, but you could explode this image of a cat into its constituent parts and then have those simply reform back into the constituent parts that represent computer. Or we could try to do like a 3D rotation, like we're going to rotate around, rotate around the cat, and then at a certain point, the computer, the computer is rotating, right? And then, you know, finally, the, the fifth way would be, uh, would be using common geometry and really dialing this stuff in. So, <laughs> Roland, <laughs> Roland would say, we want morph. We always want morph. We, we want to morph everything. That's how we, that's how we want to do it. Um, and... Something I'll say is that this method that we've employed here, it's, it would be really hard for us to change anything about how the cat looks or anything about how the computer looks later. So if we come back to it, and we think, oh boy, I really want to change some things about that cat. Well, that's going to be tough because the way we get from one scene um, to the other, um, the way we get from one object to another is dependent on how those things look. Right. So if someone came back later and said, mm, this cat should have a square head, right? The cat's head should be square. Well, that's going to negate this move here where we basically turn into a pill, you know, this intermediate pill phase wouldn't make as much sense with a squarer cat or a more triangular cat or 
if there were levels of detail of the cat that had to be there, right? Like we just, we literally just make the tail and paws go away. You know, we just rotate, we make it seem like the cat's rotating, we get rid of those. So we're going to dive into more of how this happens, more of how we conceive of this. We are going to sort of go back to the very beginning because we do have, we got a fair amount of time. We got, we got about, about 40 minutes to hang out here. So I'm going to take you back to the beginning, back to the initial concept phase of this, and hopefully we can we can get you where you want to go. Um, so the first step when you are approaching this kind of problem, uh, as I've said many, many times, is designing your assets. So when we're designing the assets, we're thinking about, in this case, how we're going to represent each of these objects. And in the first instance here, we've kind of decided what levels of detail we're going to put. What is cat? What be cat? And when we're thinking about what cat is and how we're going to show it, we could literally show a cat with very few things. So if you think about what are the what is the fewest amount of lines, what's the fewest pieces of geometry we could put out here that is cat, right? And Oftentimes I'll look at things like emoji and look at icons and consider, you know, what things are cats. Fairly universally, you might think, well, I know, I know what is cat. It's a nose. Cats have, cats have a nose with whiskers, right? That's how you know it's a cat because we look, we see whiskers, we know it is cat, right? So we might start designing our assets from there. We might start thinking, I know, I, I just need to draw some, some whiskers and that's going to be good. That's going to be the level of detail that we require to make a cat, right? And we could get away with just putting the cat's face here, right? We could really literally just start with a cat's face. That might be good enough to satisfy the brief of going from a scene of a cat to a scene of a computer, right? So always think about, what, is, what are the fewest steps we can do to get from one thing to another? So we are now going to just, I'm just gonna transform and reflect this again, I'm trying to make as few steps as possible. I got, my, I got my auto snapping on in here so that things can line up. And already you might say, well, yeah, that, that's a cat, right? Or is it a mouse? Uh, I don't know. Is it... And this is where things are. We don't have enough levels of detail to say what this is. So we need more levels of detail. One of the things that definitely tells me a thing is a cat is that cats have very distinctive eyes, right? So we might make eyes for this cat. And at this point, so I, I like to hold down uh, alt and then drag in order to, uh, to generate such things. So at this point, probably a mouse, right? This could be a mouse. We don't know. I don't know what that is. Um, so in order to create, say, what the eyes might be, we might make something like this. We just overlap a couple of circles. We go, uh, we hit, uh, what is this? Shift M brings up our shape maker, hold down alt, remove the extemporaneous parts, slot this in. And wouldn't you know it, suddenly things are looking more cat-like already. We're getting there. Um, and then you might think, well, is this enough level of detail for cat? Does this mean cat? Eyes, eyes with those very specific pupils. There is a, uh, a kind of kitschy clock um, <laughs> that looks like this, uh, that kind of Felix the cat. Um, you know what? Now you know how old I am because I know what a Felix the cat is. It's kind of an unpleasant cartoon from, from back in the day. Um, but, you know, is, does that, is that enough detail for cat? So you have to start to think about... How much level of detail are we going to put in? How are we actually going to represent this thing? The fewer levels of detail you have, the fewer the fewer defining points, the easier it's going to be to go from one thing to one anything else, right? So with all of that in mind, we arrived on these kind of points. I like to always make little notes about this thing. So I don't know if you can really see what's, what's in the notebook, but, you know, what is a cat? Pointy ears, uh, this kind of martini mouth that we have on them, which is the, the nose and then the, and then the little, little mouth. That's how you know it's a cat because it's got this funny martini mouth. 
you got to have whiskers and you got to have eyes. And then I wrote down like tail question mark. Do we want to have tail? Do we want to have paws? Do we want to have claws? So we we arrived at this form of this cat. And then we do the same exercise with the computer. We want to go through and do the same uh, thought experiment with this computer. How little can we show of the computer in order to convey what it is, right? So in this case, when we think about, all right, what are we going to represent here? Well, we've got the front of the computer, we've got the back of this thing, and kind of the ratio of these rectangles is really all we need to understand this is a laptop. If we were thinking instead, hmm, hmm, what other kind of computer might we do, right? We might represent this instead. Let's say if this was like um, like an old time uh, computer, like an Apple, um, like an Apple II kind of deal, right? Well, an Apple II might have a couple of these. Uh, da, da, da. Apple II was very vertical, if I remember correctly or any kind of desktop computer is fairly vertical. And then we can just round off these edges a little bit. All right, like this. And uh, give this a screen, copy and a paste, kind of like this. And since we're using gradients, we want to kind of use the gradient tool to help us out with defining uh, these elements, or maybe you don't, but maybe our computer has more of this kind of a ratio, and then you'd want to put in, hmm, well, we have to put in like a little disk drive down here, and we have to put in uh, little switches and knobs, right, so that we know that is what means computer to us. That's what set of objects are going to stand for a computer. Um, now, the reason that I'm kind of uh, drilling down with this kind of idea a lot is because when we transform from one anything to one anything else, we're not really transforming anything. We're just changing an arrangement of shapes. We're changing an arrangement of objects and color and shape and line that in one case can represent one thing and in the next case can represent something else by simply rearranging, resizing, and changing the composition of these elements, right? So rather, when you approach any kind of thing, whether it's cat to computer, or it's going to be maybe if we go then from computer to mouse, or we then go from uh, computer to globe, always remember that it's just a collection of shapes, and that whatever shapes you're using to represent a thing, then we go ahead and we move them around. So that's that's the high level of this, of, of this thing that we're doing. Um, and as you can see, this cat is is unimpressed with <laughs> with such with such high minded stuff. But that's the idea, right? So when you're designing your assets, however you do it, just keep that in mind. Keep in mind simplifying, and remember that we're only creating geometry that seems to mean these two things. Mm, take a drink of water. If you have any questions about this stuff, though, hit me up in the chat. I'd love to. Love to help you out if I can, and if you have any conundrums that, that get to you with this stuff. So let's go ahead and we are going to jump on in. We're gonna we're gonna make this stuff happen. How would we then go about going from that collection of shapes to a different collection of shapes? How are we gonna move this around? So in this example, what I wanted to do is start to simplify the silhouette of something. So I kind of call this method an intermediate phase, she said. What is the intermediate phase? What is a place we can go between cat and computer that is more, um, that is more malleable, that is more uh, able to shift from one to the other? And in this case, we just have this round on top, kind of flat on bottom, a sort of form that can be made of this geometry and easily become this other geometry here, right? So this can just be squished out to become that, that then can open to become that. So we're thinking about intermediate phases, these steps. And since we're starting from a character kind of perspective, how can this character move in such a way that it might start to take on that next intermediate step, 
right? So for me, I looked at the cat and I thought, well, what if it's sort of maybe like crouching down, getting ready to pounce? I do not have a cat in my house. I have a dog in my house and that dog does not do much. But in this case, um, I've seen cats. I can pull up videos of cats on the internet. I'm, I'm not anti-cat, I'm pro-cat. Um, so I was thinking, well, with this cat, what if we turn to face the camera, right? And in order to achieve this kind of, um, what we would call like a fake 3D or a faux 3D uh, turn, this 2.5D uh, turning of things, what this really is, if we really break it down, is a lot of path changes. It's a lot of uh, positional changes, mainly. So if we just call up all these positional changes of what's happening, you can start to see how the relationship of all these things makes this kind of 3D movement possible and how it happens. So we've got things like the eyes are going to be moving and the nose, which we've parented a lot of things to, is also moving. So the movement of those, their positional changes relative to this head, make it seem like it's turning to look at us, right? And the speed and distance and the change of all these things feels like it's moving in some way three-dimensionally. None of these layers are 3D, mind you. We, you could, of course, make them 3D and rotate them around. But in this case, we're keeping it abstract. We're keeping it wacky. So we're literally just translating. We got the eyes, um, this arm here, because it seems to be attached to a shoulder of some kind needs to move over as well. So we need to set positional keyframes for that. Um, I don't know why I called this the eat. It should have been called an ear. It's, that's on me. But again, these ears are shifting and changing their shape as we go. So the ears are changing position as the path is also deforming. So we're altering the path and the position as they go. And then the other thing that's kind of interesting to think about is this tail kind of tells us more of that story as well. So everything is moving in one direction, but the tail is moving in the opposite direction. And if I was feeling more clever, I guess it would have been smarter for me to make this tail uh, instead out of... Um, so right now this is made out of uh, a filled uh, path like this. You can see it's a bunch of, a bunch of points. If we wanted to maybe up the ante on this thing a little bit. Yeah, let's do that. Let's let's fix the crimes of this thing while we're working on it. So what I can do is on this tail here, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just take my pen tool and I'm just gonna try to draw a few little paths. Doop, doop, do like this. There we go. And so you can see clicking and dragging that has created a new shape in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop looking at this group and we're only going to look at this shape group up here. And we are going to have turning on this stroke that we have on here. And, oh, Frederick, a uh, longtime fan. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for joining us here on the, on the channel, uh, uh, Frederick. Um, and, uh, you know, great to see people from Montreal. It's uh, always happy to see fellow Canadians out here on the stream. I know there's not as many of us uh, as there are uh, from other places, but I love it. Uh, Montreal is just, uh, you know, a couple hours down the road from, uh, from Ottawa. I try to get there when I can. Fantastic city, beautiful scene out there. And uh, thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so before I get too distracted, I want to take this stroke here and what I want to do is I want to change it. I don't want a, a flat stroke. I want a gradient stroke. Ah, it didn't like that. Unmatched name exception. Oh, now, now After Effects is going to be angry with me. You know what? Let's, hmm, hmm, let's see. What do we do? We can go, let's delete that stroke. And we're going to simply add a gradient stroke in there. That's the way to do it. <laughs> I'm going to delete that gradient fill. And we're going to go to the gradient stroke here. And we're going to make that stroke width bigger. We're going to change it from butt caps to round caps. So that we are now kind of emulating the way this thing used to look. And we're going to edit that gradient 
And we can really just start sampling what is currently out here. So from the white, we're going to sample to the gray and the black one, we're going to sample to the black. And you'll notice that currently we can't really see much of our gradient out here. And one of the trubs is because there it is. This little two point here, these two points actually make up the gradient. This is the line of that gradient. And so as we move these points along, you can you can see the gradient kind of responding to that. So that's our that's our gradient from and to. So that's kind of important to remember. But with that taken care of, now we've kind of simplified, we've simplified this path here a little bit. So now it's down to just being this one thing, which is great. I think what we might do is, yeah, make it a little bit smaller. Let's grab the path and maybe just kind of bump it in a little bit. There we go. And what we want to do to try to fake the 3D-ness of this move the tail, if it were actually three-dimensional, should flex and change a little bit. So we're gonna set a keyframe on the path, as we do, and then we are gonna to go to the end here uh, when, when everything is kind of uh, settled to where it's gonna go. Uh, let's go to the last positional keyframe there and make sure that we can actually see the layer by dragging it out. And we're gonna set another keyframe for the path. And what I'm gonna do is just double click on here which is gonna give us access to this kind of bounding box. And I'm just going to grab this edge. We're gonna hold down, in my case, command, but for you it might be control. And we're just gonna squish, squish that in. So what that means is that as this thing is going, you can see that it's going from kind of curvy to being flat. So if this thing was three dimensional, we just want to make sure that our curve is the same for everything so that we go into our, our um, we go to our graph editor and we edit the graph by pulling these little handles, making sure that all of them have a similar kind of movement. Uh, now that subtle change makes me very happy <laughs> that it now feels a lot more three dimensional in this turn, right? So the other things that are happening are we've got the paw here that it's coming down like it was just nom, 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 licking its paw and now that paw is coming back down. It looks kind of like a ladle or something because uh, not that great at drawing paws, not that great at drawing hands, whether they're human hands or not. Um, so that's going away and we're really just fading them out. We're fading the two paws out as they come through and then we trim those layers away or we just don't see them anymore. So that's a level of detail that we're removing from the cat. We're removing it from what, what tells us this is a cat as this is, as this is turning, right? So we're simplifying the process for ourselves. We continue to simplify the silhouette even more uh, as we move on to this next phase here. We have the cat kind of, kind of do a little hmm as it kind of, lunges maybe, maybe it's pouncing a little bit. I think if we left the pause in here, it would be nice to have the pause kind of come forward and, and do something, but I am uh, by nature a lazy person and attempting to simplify things is usually the way to go. So this kind of move, this hmm, and then, and then jumping forward is achieved simply using scale. So all the facial features we've parented to the head here and the head is simply scaling up as, as it moves down. So we're adjusting its position and scale at the same time so that they kind of flump forward like this. Also, we've got the body and the head parented to this null, and this null is also getting larger. So we're kind of two-staging it a little bit where we're having this is scaling up and the body is changing shape and the whole thing is scaling up and it's all happening with these overlapping keyframes, these overlapping movements that are happening. So if you have a look here, we've even got, we've got some eyelid change. The eyelids, these paths here, they're changing as it clumps forward here. So we're combining a lot of movement at the same time, right? We're, we're having a lot of these changes at the same time. So it feels a little bit more alive, right? And, you know, I thought, well, it should probably hang out here. This is kind of an interesting spot to hang out and it might be nice. I just have the eyes shift back and forth and the nose shift back and forth. Um, 
those movements, which we can have a look at here, we're looking at the nose and we're looking at the eyes and then we're looking at these eyes. If you ever wanna call up all the keyframes that you have on a layer, you can just select it and you hit the letter U and then there it goes. Um, so with all of these keyframes, you can see that they all just kind of lag a little bit. So I've got, whoop. so we've got here that it's like the pupils are going and then the whites of the eyes are following. So pupil follow, pupil follow. And one fun way to do that is to start with everything right on top of each other. Then you can select the keyframes, hold down Alt, and then you can drag the last keyframe and it kind of stretches it out. So just to, uh, just to enjoy the difference, if they were the same, that has a certain feel to it as well. But if we grab them and we stretch them, stretch, stretch, that feels a little bit funnier. It feels a little bit weirder that, that something is lagging, that something is, um, is, is a little bit unhinged about this. So I, I love the idea that it kind of feels like the nose is leading them. So I don't know much about cats, but I, I imagine that if they smell something, they kind of move their nose towards it and then the eyes go towards it. Although cats are kind of a predator animal, so with their front-facing eyes, the eyes might be the thing that we move towards first, and uh, and then the rest of it moves. So, again, these are these are considerations that a character animator would have. I'm a humble motion graphics designer, so I uh, I'm totally comfortable having unreal cats uh, go around. The next move here that happens, though, we got to turn into that we got to turn into that computer, right? We got to go from cat to computer. We got to deliver on our promise here. Um, so the move here is I'm kind of setting it up. I'm trying to set up this next movement where we've got the eyes kind of going forward and backward. So they're kind of going left, right, left. So they're going this way, then this way, then this way. And each time they're going a little bit stronger in each direction. So a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then big movement. And the big movement is for this whole situation to start to push to snap in the other direction. Now, originally I just had the eyes kind of move off, but then I thought, you know what? I should cover that up because the level of detail is getting so small as we shrink everything down. It didn't make too much sense uh, for me to have these, this little face <laughs> on the computer. So at a certain point, I just have a circle cover it up, which granted, not the classiest move, but it hides that little crime. And because we're anticipating the movement to go in that direction, then, <coughs> oh, hairball, uh, then this line animating on from that origin point feels like it makes a little bit more sense, right? So that's like the disk drive line, I guess. That's a feature of computers, right? We still have... We still have physical media, right? Um, and that this just goes shoom. So that's a little layer, level of computer computerness that we are adding some geometry that mean computer um, right in there. So as this is coming on, this is the break point, we would call it. There's a point at which the shapes stop belonging to the first object and start belonging to the second object not all shapes need to turn into the next thing. So we don't necessarily need to take the circle of the cat's head and make it into a part of the computer. We don't need to take the nose of the cat and make it into a part of the computer. In fact, what we're doing is we're taking the whole face of the cat and covering it up. We're replacing it in this instance with this pill shape, this, this rounded rectangle that simply becomes the drive, the drive of the computer. And it's a little bit of a match cut because it's it's matching the movement that that object would have as it leaves frame. And it's perfectly good to just, to just roll it on like that. The other thing that's happening is that this whole thing is growing and shrinking at the same time, kind of. So at the same time that it's growing in one dimension, it seems to be shrinking in another. It's a little bit of chaos, right? That we're combining 
these this kind of growing, shrinking, and then finally opening as we are we are sort of we've completed our movement from one thing to another. But all of the cat is gone at this point. Cat gone. And we've moved into a, a period where computer is here. Hello, computer. Um, in the chat, let me know who whose album Hello Computer is. Is that somebody? I know Dirty Computer is, is somebody. Uh, it's Janelle Monet. But in this case, right, we have all of the cat objects are gone, and now we're moving into the computer objects, right? And the point at which they are almost exactly the same, the point at which they're indistinguishable from each other is right here, where the geometry of this, this chonky boy here has now become this thing, right? And it's not, it's no, it's no, there's no magic happening here. It's just you know, one thing happens to get close to the same size and proportion of the other, and our brain fills in the, the difference, right? That is the trick of almost every morph, of almost every uh, changing from one thing into another, that there is this moment when you slow it down that one thing comes and one thing goes. Radiohead, boom. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, man. Of course. Of course. Um so, uh, yeah, we have this we have this moment here where the one thing comes and the other thing goes, and then you know we just have these eyes kind of pop on. It's like the cat is now inside the computer, right? And that tells the whole story for us. That that takes us from from one end of it to the other end of it. That's where that's where we kind of want to be going. So, with that in mind, there's a lot of parts that we can we can touch on. We can go in deeper on any of them. Do let me know in, in the comments, though. I'd love to know if anything, anything about this process is uh, vexing or is, um, how to say, uh, that if any of it is uh, confusing as well. <laughs> Schroding, Schrodinger's computer cat? That's right. It's, uh, it's both inside and not inside at the same time. There's a point at which it is both and neither. Um, actually, I really love that. I might steal that if I, if I ever... Uh, uh, re redo this kind of thing uh, there, Joseph, because it is that it is that same idea that at one point it is both things and it is nothing, right? So if that makes sense, um, but yeah, do let me know. I think we're gonna we're going to. I would love to talk a little bit more about uh, alternate methods that we might have used to get here. <laughs> it's more Hello Kitty than Hello Computer. I love that. That's. Uh... It's pretty hilarious. If you're on YouTube and you are not seeing the behance.net uh, chat, you're missing out. There are some of the best jokes in here <laughs> that are, you know, when the host cracks up, that's when you know it's good. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, are we going to see AI technology that can make this kind of thing uh, faster? What's interesting is that this is the kind of thing that AI doesn't do a great job with, right? Because this is a lot of subjective um, choices that we're making. But this brings up a really interesting point about where AI can actually help us, that uh, AI um, has the way, um, has a way of suggesting, like as a suggestion engine can be very interesting, um, that doing in-betweens, there was actually a, a, an article uh, that I posted on Twitter. Uh, I'm at E.C. Abrams on Twitter. Find me on there um, about um, a, using AI to basically make up in between frames when we're taking like 24 frames a second footage and turning it into 60 frames a second footage. <coughs> and it was so interesting, the seamlessness of that, right? And to see it done with live footage was interesting, but you could also apply it to animation as well. That if we animate things at eight frames a second and we want to go to 24, right? All that in-between drawing, could an AI do that by simply looking at a, a corpus of, of anime and then having it figure out uh, the stuff. But we're going to, let's look at, at some, of the, some of the areas that, you know, because it brings up this idea of subjective taste and of creative directing and of making choices. Right? I, I think if, if any of you are, are familiar with the other talks I do with, with a lot of the things I, I get into, um, 
all of this motion design stuff. Um, and it comes down to subjective choices. And that's kind of the main job of design is to make these choices. And sometimes you're limited by what the tool can do, but sometimes you are empowered by what the, the tool is capable of. Um, for example, we might have approached this entire problem inside of Animate, of CC Animate instead, which uh, used to be Flash, but we are able to do um, a lot of things, like if we wanted to do this frame by frame, we could do this entirely uh, in a frame by frame traditional animation way to do something that is perhaps way more, um, way more fluid and way more dynamic, right? <coughs> oh my goodness. Um, and uh, what's really interesting about that is the idea that in here we're doing a lot of kind of linear movements or we're doing a lot of keyframed stuff. If we were to do it frame by frame using CC Animate, for example, it would be a totally different process where we would be starting to rough in the movements and we would be taking a whole other line. I don't know, maybe that's what we should do, do next week. We should approach it that way. But there's so many different ways to approach this stuff. Um, but uh, uh, Kendall uh, is, is uh, in the chat uh, talking about Lottie and uh, body moving. Um, what's really fun about what we've made here, we can literally export this exactly with body moving. We just go up and we hit export and away it goes. Um, because all of this is made with shape layers, nulls, uh, position, rotation, and path changes. So all of this stuff that's happening in here can be totally exported um, that, uh, that comes from, I don't know, the, because it can be transposed out of this almost directly, we could turn this into an HTML5 uh, JSON if we wanted to, right? Um, which is one of the interesting powers of working predominantly with shape layers. So, um, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's true. It, it's, it's true, Javid. Sometimes, sometimes I, have good, I have good insights, sometimes not. Uh, <laughs> that's what's crazy about things being live. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, subjective choices, why we might do one thing or another thing. And if you're coming in late to this, if you missed us getting into detail about, about making this cat thing happen, then you're, you're missing out. Um, so working from this principle here, we des I decided, I decided, there's no we here, only, only I made that choice, to have the cat come down like this, right? I could just as easily have had the cat rear back and become kind of a pill shape on its own to create this pill shape and then just have it fall over. You know, it could just topple over onto its side and that would get us this pill shape anyway, right? That's a way we could get from one to the other. So choosing to have it go kind of a squashed circle and then expand, well, that's a subjective choice, right? Could an artificial intelligence make that call? I don't know. Could it suggest that avenue? I hope. If it's if artificial intelligence is any good at its job, right? Ooh. Ah, refreshing. So in this case, when you're seeing objects, when you're seeing geometry, and you want to use what we've been calling the intermediate phase, think about how you might get there. What are some clever ways you might get there, you know? In this case, because it's a character, we need to think about motivation a little bit. So if we wanted this cat to turn into a, a vertical pill shape, you know, what would cause the cat to do that? Well, maybe there's some string that gets dangled and then it kind of reaches up for the string and then falls over and becomes the laptop. That might be funny. Ooh, then it would be a laptop with a cat attacking a string on it. You know what, I immediately regret all of my choices. I should have done that. But, uh, or, you know, then it becomes a constant loop of then the cat's on the screen and we zoom into the screen. Um, but that's a consideration you want to make, right? Or alternatively, you might decide that, well, the move here is to take little details about this cat and let's expand on those, you know, maybe you know, this head, this black head of, of the cat, well, maybe that could turn into this little camera up here. Maybe that could be something. And maybe the body becomes the rectangle. So that could be a way to go, right? That you might want to think about morphing the geometry in those ways. So 
always have these considerations in mind when you're going to be creating things. Um, we're not really uh, bound by too much when we start to think more abstractly about our about our situation. Um, even in this easiest one, the easy what we call easy mode here is that we can still imbue this uh, with a lot. <laughs> With a lot of life, um, and uh, and and do something interesting with it. <laughs> Kendall, you're right. There there should be a mouse for it to attack. I thought about that a lot of t a lot of the time when when thinking about this. I was wondering that, you know, wouldn't be interesting, like if if there was a mouse that kind of ran around, and then the cat maybe jumps to pounce on the mouse, and then when it pounces on it, it kind of splashes out and then becomes the computer in that way, like the cat's like made of liquid. Uh, sometimes I think cats might be made of liquid because they can really squeeze through tight spaces, but that's a that's a matter for a whole other area. And for someone who's way more comfortable in, say, pose-to-pose -pose or straight-ahead traditional animation techniques, making a cat leap on a mouse and then splash out into becoming a computer would be totally in line with what they're down with, right? They'd be uh, totally, um, totally doable with with cracking open CC Animate, making that happen, you know, animate it on the on the twos, and you'll be good to go. Or you know what, do it on the threes. Don't don't spend a lot of time. Um, but speaking of uh, you know imbuing things with character, I did want to did want to speak briefly about how this kind of works, how you might make something like this, simple though it may be conceptually, right? That something pops on, the cat pays attention to it, and now we're moving into the next scene. This idea of reaction, I think is really important, especially when dealing with character and when imbuing things uh, with levels of detail. You know, how much detail should we add? In this case, we got this bleep, and then you know, the ear twitches towards it, and then the head moves towards it, and then we're going places, right? So this is what we would call like a setup. Like you wanna set up these moves when you're doing these transitions so that it doesn't feel sudden, you know? In fact, what I can do is I can remove those entirely and y'all just let me know if that feels better. Does it? Mm, feels, feels quite a bit worse to me actually because we no longer have that priming, right? We're not being primed to think about about movement or change or something's about to happen. Whoa, what's gonna happen? Who knows? Something, what's that square? Whoa. And we can even telegraph that even more if we just put a little X up here, you know, a little X up in the corner, that's gonna look like it's a, it, it is becoming like a little window or had we have gone with a line style for this, maybe, you know, a little, um, a little Windows 95 uh, window goes around them, that kind of move. Uh, that could be very interesting. But even in this simple form, right, we're able to communicate a lot of character and nuance boop, with just a few, well, a few, I say, keyframes in here. It might seem a little complex, but one of the things you want to do, especially when working with um, things that are character driven, um, are making sure you parent everything to everything else as you like it. So we've got eyelids parented to the head, we've got the ears parented to the head, so that when I rotate the head around or I, I do something with the head, everything moves with it so I can get more motion out of less work. So parent things together, that's really important. And then consider um, what they're doing and what they're responding to. So in this case, you'll notice not a lot of these keyframes line up over each other. Um, and that's very intentional that what we want is for things to be kind of staggered. You know, the eyes we do together and we, they kind of snap around, um, using this kind of a, a speed graph, but you know, it's a, that's because I wanted that kind of snappiness, but everything else is kind of, kind of laconic and it's kind of, kind of snap and drag and those kinds of ideas. So something to, something to think about um, as you as you work through your projects. We are coming into the end of it here. Thank you so much for joining me here on behance.net slash live. 
at the Adobe Live program. I've been Evan Abrams. I continue to be Evan Abrams, and this has been a MoGraph mashup. We're going to do another one next week, so we are going to be going from something to something else. What what things will it be? Make sure you you follow us on uh, on all the social channels. Make sure you're subscribed here because there is going to be a poll. We are going to be asking you, and we are going to be uh, doing whatever the audience says because that's how we do it here on the program. So. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for spending time with me here. And I, I really appreciate it uh, coming in, getting getting active in the chat. It's great to see so many people hanging out here at the end of the day on Friday. So hope you all have a great weekend. And uh, thank you for uh, for joining me. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, if you want to, if you want to get those, want to get part of that survey, be part of our little producers club uh, here, then uh, make sure you follow me on Twitter. I'm at EC Abrams on there, or make sure you follow uh, Adobe in all of its forms on all the social media. Thanks again for watching and have a great day.